is here to join us for a while. And we're here both to, to welcome you. In fact, I've got two roles. I'm here to ask you to put this on mute um, and to welcome you to this event. Um, we have uh, the, the program on philanthropy and, and social innovation is particularly proud to be able to host this event uh, because we think this is a very important report, uh, breaking the binary. Um, I think it's significant for a variety of reasons. I mean, one, you would expect no less out of a collaboration amongst these four partners, uh, the combination of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, uh, the SK Group, Insight at um, Pacific Community Ventures, and Harvard's Initiative for Responsible Investment. Um, and with that foursome, you can imagine that it's going to be a really substantive and helpful report. Um, we also think this is important because the timing is so good. I mean, it feels as though the public, private, and social sectors are truly poised uh, to try to kind of harness the capacities of each sector to, to address really nagging social problems. Uh, and so we're particularly delighted that joining in this conversation will be two leaders in the U.S. government, Elizabeth Littlefield of OPEC and uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, an alumni of, of uh, the Aspen Institute, but also a head of, of the uh, White House Office of Social Innovation, um, and also uh, a leader in an inter inter governmental group, uh, Julie Katzman, who's COO of the uh, IDB. So we're you know, particular welcome to them because of the policy focus. This feels like a really good opportunity to talk about how to put forth policy enablers for this kind of work, but also how to kind of get rid of the underbrush of any uh, uh, policy obstacle. Um, I now have the opportunity to turn this over to Catherine Milligan of the Schwab Foundation, and she will introduce the report and the panel. So thank you, Catherine. Welcome, and thank you all for coming. Uh, a very big thank you also to our distinguished panel today. I'm Catherine Milligan. I'm a director of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, the sister organization of the World Economic Forum. We select and support a global network of social entrepreneurs, which I'm delighted to see represented here today by Kyle Zimmer, a Schwab Foundation social entrepreneur. And we also work with an international group of scholars, policymakers, practitioners, and investors called the Global Agenda Council on Social Innovation. And I'm thrilled to have Elizabeth Littlefield, the chair of that council, join us today, alongside Julie Katzman and Jonathan Greenblatt, also members of the council. And it's only fitting, because we're here today, to celebrate the launch of the Policy Guide to Scaling Social Innovation which is a research report that's been more than a year in the making that was born out of the council and that has been guided by them throughout. I'd also like to acknowledge our thanks to our research partners, Insight and the Initiative for Responsible Investing at Harvard University, and thank our host at the Aspen Institute. And I'd like to invite Jonathan Green back up to give a few framing remarks for our panel discussion. Thank you. kiss. So thank you very much, Catherine, for that introduction. Boy, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I'm spending more time here at Aspen than when I actually worked at Aspen. Because um, I was just here last week doing something with Elliot and with John Bridgeland around issues related to national service and disconnected youth. But I'm particularly pleased to be here today to talk about the impact economy and the important work of the, of the council in this report. Um, because it's stuff that I certainly care quite a bit about for, and have for a long time and I'm working on now at the White House. Before I do that, let me just a couple words of thanks. First of all, thanks to Catherine for a remarkable stewardship over the past year of all of us who participated on the Council. We had folks participating from how many continents? Four continents, I think. So you had uh, lots of conference calls at odd hours and lots of kind of people to coordinate. You did a marvelous job of that. I want to thank the folks who are here from OPEC. Is Elizabeth here? I didn't see her. Oh, there she is. Elizabeth, and for her tremendous leadership at OPEC, and my colleagues here from the State Department, from USAID, and from all the federal agencies who do this work every day, um, particularly David at the Institute for Responsible Investing and Ben at the Insight Division at PCV. We're glad you're here. And particularly to Jane, to Jane and to Elliot, from everyone here at the Aspen Institute, who continues to make Aspen sort of a center for thought leadership and a center for these kinds of convenings. And there are a few places in town, to be honest, where you can go and have these kinds of discussions about these issues. In my opinion, Aspen plays a crucial role in the kind of intellectual ecosystem 
uh, and bring this all together. So thank you, Jane, and thank you everyone to ask me. So how many of you had a chance to take a look at the report? So, you know, we believe in these issues of impact investing, of social entrepreneurship, and more generally, the rubric of social innovation. When the president talks about it, he frames it as a new, finding new ways to solve all problems. But one of the most interesting things that we think about social innovation, it's finding ways for government to, it acknowledges up front that government alone doesn't have the answers. That the way we're going to move the needle, the way we're going to make a difference, and the way we'll finally get progress in some of our toughest problems is by engaging folks from the outside on a cross-sector basis. And impact investing and this body of work really exemplifies that. Because it's about not only engaging the disciplines and the thought leadership of the capital markets and the private sector, but it's working in partnership with government to really move the needle, as I said, on really tough problems. And if you look at the frame of the report, if you look at how it starts with building government capacity, it's really what my office exemplifies at the White House. The President created it in early 2009 to bring these ideas directly into the Executive Office of the President and to institutionalize in government this notion of making social innovation not an occasional strategy but a core element of his operating plan for the country. So day in and day out, we're thinking about how can we accelerate economic recovery, how can we jumpstart job creation, and how can we create stronger communities. What's nice, and again, I think is exemplified by the work of the Council, is you see that this isn't just happening here. It's happening all over the world. And I think the power of this report and its utility is helping to create a framework to think about this. So it can be replicated beyond the U.S., beyond the U.K., beyond Peru, beyond Australia, beyond Canada, to countries all over the world. And it becomes a way that we look at all kinds of problems, because ultimately social innovation is not the end. Social innovation is a means to an end. It's a way to accelerate achievement on our priorities. It's a way to make progress on our most important challenges. And so that's why I think this report is so fundamental and so timely. Because at a moment where we're facing tight, a tight fiscal climate, at a moment when we're facing some real economic challenges that seem pervasive and systemic, we think, the President believes, that social innovation is a lever, if you will, that we can use to kind of finally finally um, propel progress in places where we need it most. So I want to hand the, hand the agenda back off, but I, I can't say enough about the important work that our scholars, Ben and David, and all of your teams have done. And thanks again to Catherine and all the participants from the Global Agenda Council who made this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. My name is Colby Daly. I'm with Pacific Community Ventures. And so I wanted to just reiterate all of the thanks that have been already said, um, specifically to the Aspen Institute and, of course, to Catherine for all of her help shepherding this project through. And I also wanted to thank a couple of folks by name, um, specifically my colleague Sarah Ritter from Pacific Community Ventures and also Katie Grace from the in Initiative for Responsible Investment at Harvard, both of whom were additional um, primary researchers, authors, and editors of this report. Um, Jonathan was mentioning, you know, how this was really a, 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 a practical example. This our framework was an example of, of government action and practice, and just as another example of that, we're excited to say that um, Sarah is actually traveling to the UK this summer to be seconded to the UK Cabinet Office, working closely with them as they prepare for the G8 summit in Northern Ireland in June and um, contributing to the strategy and thinking around their focus, the G8's focus on a theme, which is social investment this year. Another example of how really government is taking this very seriously. So we're thrilled to be here today to talk about our research. And <clears throat> this research builds on prior findings um, that have really up to this point been more of a conceptual policy design tool for specifically thinking about how policy affects or can affect markets. And what's exciting about this project is that it presents a process for public in, uh, participation in social innovation. 
So it's, it's really taking it one step further. And this research project is a product of a lot of collaboration. As Catherine and Jonathan mentioned, we've benefited, benefited from global networks of leadership like the, Gen the Global Agenda Council at the World Economic Forum, uh, the, Im the uh, Impact Investing Policy Collaborative, which is a global network of policymakers and researchers. And, and it's through that group that, this, that uh, has really made this project a reality. So thank you. So here's the wheel that you see in, in the report, and this model is based on case studies. So it's not hypothetical, it's not conceptual, it's actually not our construct, it's what we're seeing already in the market. It's an example of government action, in, it's, what, it's government action in real time. And um, as Jonathan said, the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation, we're seeing this activity already happening. It's practical. It's replicable, and um, what's really exciting is it's demonstrating how the public sector is an innovator in and of itself. And um, just to kind of put this into another context, we're sort of thinking about what would this analog, what would this public innovator analog be in the private sector? And um, we actually took a look at Cisco, which has four vectors of innovation. Um, the first for Cisco is building capacity, and in Cisco's language, that's really talking about gathering data, collecting information, which is critical, of course, to public innovation. Um, the second is igniting the base, which is really about building that internal capacity. Um, the third is, is imagining the future, and that's where um, Jane mentioned those nagging social problems. That's really thinking about weighing the solutions for attacking them. and. Um, the fourth, and really critical, is changing that customer conversation. And for, for Cisco, that's about co-creation. And when we think about it in this context, it's really about making governments, governments smarter, um, where they're outcome-driven and empowering communities and collaborating with their stakeholders. So with that, you know, we're very excited about how this presents for us or represents uh, the new era of public innovation in res with respect to social enterprise and impact investing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Wood from the Initiative for Responsible Investment to walk us through the wheel. I have to be able to see. I don't want to make too much of a confessional of this presentation, but um, my allergies are so bad that in order to be able to present, I had to take an allergy pill that made me incredibly dopey. And uh, right before this, I went out and got a monster energy drink to balance it out. So I feel great, but what I say, I may not be responsible for. Um, so I'm just going to go through very quickly and put some examples that are in, in, in this report. And they're practical examples. Like I said, you know, we did the, the last time we were here at Aspen, we talked about the football. And the football was a framework that was meant to sort of think about where policy sits. Uh, now we're sort of. Never, oh, sh it's because the graphics are moving. Not very good for the allergy pill. Um, uh, you, you know, so this one was really to take some specific examples of things that have happened. And the, I want to say a couple things about what's in the wheel. In the first place, um, behind this sits the sort of fundamental decision somewhere by policymakers that uh, engaging private sector capital is the right thing to do. It's not always the right thing to do, and not every problem needs that as a solution. So we want to put that uh, you know, ethical and practical decision behind the wheel because it's there. If that's the path you're going down, these are steps you can take, and here's some examples of steps you can take. Um, and uh, the, the second thing about this is that these are rather arbitrary distinctions, obviously. You know, they're sort of different pieces, and they flow into each other. We've carved them out because it becomes a useful way to think. But we don't assume that policies exist in a vacuum. And in fact, one of the lessons of the wheel is that each piece is meant to reinforce the other, um, as I'll talk about in a second. So moving forward. Um, and now I can't, I'm going to say the names wrong, but so because of the, the angle here, but so engage market stakeholders. And this is one of these first ecosystem development things. Impact investing is a new language. Obviously, the practice is old for lots of institutions and places, but we're having a new, um, and, and Mildred and I talked about this a little bit right before this, a sort of new confluence or, 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 or nexus of stakeholders. Oh, thank you. That's perfect. That was very smart, Colby. Um, you know, gathering together um, to uh, 
to sort of talk about impact investing. And one of the things that policymakers can do is just call the question and bring stakeholders into the same room. And this has been a policy you know, action. So we've seen the examples we have in the case are in Senegal and in India, but uh, uh, they are uh, very specifically just bringing together people. The Office of Social Innovation does this you know, all the time uh, to get different sectors to converge around a single conversation. That is the kind of ecosystem development that makes the tool making that might come in another step actually work. And I think people are finding that this looks soft and fuzzy. It's actually pretty fundamental to the development of hard tools. Um, uh, the second one we have here is uh, develop government capacity for action. And so this is actually building internally for policymakers. And here we have two national level uh, programs. Um, the uh, Department of Social Prosperity in Colombia and then the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation here. Um, you know, what you do is internalize into government the ability to not only just call the question, bring the sectors together, talk about the issue, but to then develop some kind of uh, analysis of uh, the policy implications of what impact investing is doing. And again, I'm just, you can, you're going to read the report, so you'll see, you'll have these fleshed out and in depth, you know, as soon as you get home. But uh, so this is just a teaser. Um, but then you have so the sort of tool making. Uh, piece of this discussion. So you build the ecosystem, you get people engaged, you find the right stakeholders. Uh, we've also found governments building active tools to build infrastructure and to put money out directly. And so you have uh, the two examples we have in the report. We have Big Society Capital in the United Kingdom, which is a fund of funds in a sense, right? It's putting money into intermediaries. It's an infrastructure development play as well as a co-investing play. And it's meant to create the kind of thing that we have here in the community investment space, a set of intermediaries that will last beyond the attention of policymakers. Um, in Ghana, uh, you have a, a sort of similar uh, kind of thing in the Venture Capital Trust Fund, which was really made to become uh, the lead investor and develop a field where there were no private investors, co-invest with the private investors, bring them into Ghana, and hopefully have the field take off. Uh, before then, again, just to reiterate the same point, these things work in part because there's an ecosystem in which you can invest. Um, but what we found in a lot of places is uh, it's impact investment. People are trying to work in hard areas, particularly, say, in Latin America. We were just, uh, for this report, we were in Lima. Uh, the, the, the sort of Latin American governments are focused right now on social inclusion. Uh, for a lot of them, this means engaging indigenous and rural populations. Uh, that, there are not a lot of investable opportunities necessarily for impact investors. And so if you don't work the demand side through policy, your intermediaries won't have anything you know, to put money into. And so what you find policies here, one in the UK, to bring social enterprises up to investability, but also in Peru uh, to develop rural enterprises in particular, diversify local economies is what the, is what the policy um, does, but it's really to create investable options and sort of open the playing field for the different kinds of intermediaries that are active. And a, a lot of exciting things were happening in Peru. It was really fascinating. Um, you also have more direct policies that are just meant to direct private capital into the market. And the example, it was funny, this, was, this came directly from the council, right? Uh, people wanted to look at PRIs uh, globally. What does it mean to work with foundations uh, and engage uh, one specific set of mission-driven investors to put up the risk capital that everyone says they need, but no one actually is you know, out there, and Julie made this point in Lima, it's not out there in the market. Um, uh, and, Here's an ecosystem problem. Not everyone has a big set of private foundations who might take this on, right? You have to have a philanthropic community which you can invest. But it becomes, as a model for elsewhere in the world, a good way to engage a specific set of investors on the kind of capital that's really the but-for capital. And I think that's been a lesson that people have tried to take up. Our Canadian example is a little bit different. Uh, in Canada, they created a tax credit to put money into community development enterprises, but you really had to sort of find the end user and invest in them directly. And that became too difficult. Retail investors can't do that. So they had you know, the bright idea of bringing together an intermediary function that could aggregate this capital and make it investable for uh, people who wanted to take advantage of the incentive. And that very well could have been an example for this last category, this review and refine policy, right? You put out the tax incentive, you find no one's taking it up, you don't just ditch it, you figure out why it's not working and find ways to make it better. Um, and we have two examples here that I think were, are particularly meant to call attention to the way that countries are grab and countries, regions, however you want to call it, but we're, we're seeing these policies develop all at once. People talk about social impact, innovation, inclusion, you know, investment all at once, and they're grabbing models from other parts of the world and importing it into their own uh, locale or, or, or social context. And what that requires is change. 
you know, not everything works the same. And so in Australia, you found uh, social impact bonds became social benefit bonds. And uh, the real innovation there was a, a change in risk sharing and a different role for government in taking on risk in order to engage the private sector, in particular institutional investors, who are not right now, I would say, you know, in the US or the UK context, likely investors in social impact bonds. Uh, but then you also have, um, in China, the uh, microcredit uh, program, which is, I think, uh, exemplary of two things. One is the idea that you can pilot something and bring it to scale. And I just found this fast. We had a presentation on this at a meeting we did in Brazil a while back. and. Uh, our presenter is a wonderful you know, uh, economist who's describing you know, very sort of uh, theoretically what he's doing. He says, well, I had to create a pilot program. And, and so we carved out you know, five regions, about 100 million people, just to check it out. And then we're going to bring it to scale. And we're like, ah, oh, yeah, <laughs> you're working in a different world. Uh, um, but it's also what they found is sort of the idea of microcredit itself wasn't enough to engage these rural communities. And it became an industrial policy. And especially for agriculture and for uh, 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 the raising of pigs, was the example he gave. You know, we sort of found that this is something that can work in these contexts, and we can really do industrial policy along with lending, and create a local lending community that uh, sort of uh, a, a bank sprang up in villages that didn't exist before. So it's not just the program; it became this much broader thing than microcredit loans. So that's our wheel, uh, and that should give you a brief. Uh, you know, set of examples that you'll find in the report, and now you'll hear from people who actually do things, um, how they're putting these things into practice. So, Ben, I'll call you up, and you can introduce the panel. Thanks. All right. Can people hear me? Yep. Great. Well, what we're getting set up, um, thanks again. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And I was so pleased. Um, that Jonathan had called out, particularly Catherine and her efforts leading this project out of the World Economic Forum. It's just, it was such, such a thrill working with Catherine and, um, and it just made the whole project um, uh, seem very smooth. But um, we, we, we have a phenomenal panel today. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, you have people's bios in front of you, but just to uh, quickly uh, run down the line, Elizabeth Littlefield is the president and CEO of Maybe OPIC, uh, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, also has a lot of private sector experience. And you'll see a theme throughout the panel is a lot of experience both in the private sector and the public sector, which is really what we're talking about here. So very appropriate. Um, Julie Katzman, similarly, uh, is the Executive Vice President and CEO of the Inter-American Development Bank. Both Elizabeth and Julie uh, are members of the Global Agenda Council. Um, Mildred is the Executive Vice President of the Small Enterprise Assistance Funds. I'm not sure how large they are, like $250 million or thereabout? Oh, actually more historically than that, about $400 million currently okay. under management, yeah. There you go. So one of the largest impact investors uh, in dozens of countries throughout the world doing this investing. And, uh, and Mildred is an OPIC alum, so also has that public, right. public sector experience. And Kyle Zimmer is the President and CEO of First Book and a uh, Schwab Foundation social entrepreneur. Um, so many accolades and awards, you know, uh, social entrepreneur of the year in the United States a few years ago, among numerous other awards, and we're just thrilled I've been to have- talking to my mother. Have a car with us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'd like to begin, Elizabeth, with, with you, if, if, mm -hmm. if, if I may. Um, if you could just, you've been traveling recently, <laughs> to, uh, including to the World Economic Forum meeting in South Africa where um, I'm sure you spoke with other policymakers and impact investors. And I was wondering whether you could just set the stage for us a little bit. I mean, we're very excited about this. We think governments are, are, are um, moving on this quickly and in many different directions. And perhaps you could uh, temper our enthusiasm or give us a reality yeah. check based on your experience in South Africa mm -hmm. and where you think things are at in, for social innovation, which I know is a term that 
you know, especially Fonda, but um, if you could just lay the, lay the groundwork for us. I love social innovation. <laughs> I just I think we have, some, we have some work to do around def definitions, but <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I just got back from Cape Town yesterday, I guess. And uh, there's, there was a lot of buzz around this, but I think more generally on the continent I see, and I'd be interested to hear what others see, um, there's, there's, there's a huge buzz around the role of the private sector in development more generally. And I think this is something that we've been seeing really cresting, or hopefully not cresting, it's really been a, a trajectory over the last couple of years. Um, you know, if you think about it, the development finance institutions like, my, like, like OPEC, you know, just 10 years ago we were doing $10 billion a year in financing and now we're doing 40. So that's a really big growth and I think we're seeing that the, the, the way, harnessing the private sector more generally to apply to, to solve development problems is something that was much bigger and bigger on the agenda at the WEF, I thought. So, now, with respect to social innovation specifically, um, you know, the more sophisticated countries like South Africa have a very, um, you know, a very broad program and a multifaceted program in place, which I think is very exciting. But it's clear that the, you know, many of the other countries, they may be doing social innovation, but they don't know it. Um, or they may not call it that. It's kind of like, it reminds me in the microfinance world when you had big banks all over the world that were kind of doing microfinance, but they didn't know it because they, they called it something different. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we haven't yet gotten to the point where the term social innovation is fully uh, it penetrated you know, all the 54 countries in Africa at all. Um, so just coming back to your question around definition, so I see a couple of challenges. We had an interesting session at the WEF on, on social innovation generally and, and on the policy front. And I, th I see a couple of challenges to moving the field ahead. And I think, let me just mention what, what, what they were, the ones that came up anyway in our conversations. One is, again, this issue of language. Are we talking about impact investing or social innovation or social entrepreneurship? Or how does that relate to sustainability? So I think that we would all do it, ourselves a great service by defining more clearly what we mean by that. And as you were saying earlier, you know, maybe it's the social innovations in which the impact investors are investing. But I think we, we, it would be useful to get clear on that because I think people aren't super clear on what's in and what's out. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's very it's, uh, uh, attached to that is the is the need for clarity around what me, what what defines success. Because if you talk to the impact investing world, there's some that would say just return of capital is enough, all the way out to folks that think you need a commercial or competitive market return, and that. And then what's that mean? Because I don't think, I think the world does no longer agree on what a, a, a normal market return exactly. is anymore. So this sort of clear about what defines success both in the financial dimension and also on the, on the, imp, on the social impact dimension would be very useful. And then I'd say, the, well there's a bunch of other ones, but the, I'd say a third one which I see as a, as a looming problem is, is that there's, there's a, a notion that, that these models can solve all kinds of problems and there's a lot of frustration on both sides. There's the frustration of the <clears throat> entrepreneurs who say, I got these great ideas and there's no capital among you investors to finance me um, because they're early stage entrepreneurs. And then there's a, a frustration amongst the investors who say, well, I got all this money, but there's no investable opportunities. And I think that actually maybe stems from the, the definitional issue and the clarity of goal issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, which is right? And then I think that leads to the last observation that I've made and maybe why in Africa you don't see as much discussion of this is is the recognition that you need many different types of capital with different risk appetites to come together at the right moment mm -hmm. to advance the field so you need early stage foundation money which isn't present in much of the continent you need the, you know the, the venture kind of money then you need the scale up money and it's not just that you get a great idea and then the money comes to it and off you go yeah, so I think these are the kind of things that I'm hearing some wooliness around that I think we would benefit from, from clarity. And I think that's why this, this paper is extremely helpful because it does give specific and concrete examples as to, as to what governments can do. Great, thank you. The, the need for segmentation is, is something yeah. here. And I think, I think that the p people are focused on that, that's great. Um, Julie, if I, could, uh, if I could turn to you. I, I, I was um, fortunate to be in, uh, in Peru at the, the uh, World Economic Forum meeting and, and you were there and spoke on a panel. And I thought it was interesting, you were connecting in a way I hadn't heard done before, at least, at least not articulated as well as you had, connecting some of these ideas to the role of bigger companies in particular that have a huge presence in some of those markets 
and so you are emphasizing things like public-private partnership and, mm -hmm. and having social innovation models embedded within those larger companies. And I'm just wondering from a government perspective, like how, how can the public sector facilitate that? Like, like what are you seeing, particularly in Latin America, around the way governments are working in that direction particularly? So uh, different ways in different places and, and, and driven, much as you were just saying, um, Elizabeth, by the heterogeneity of the problems and the types of solutions and the stage of development. Right. So let's take um, one of the examples I used in, in Peru was um, a, a program that we're involved in as a bank uh, called Improve Your Streets. And you know, there's a big problem everywhere in the emerging markets that infrastructure doesn't get to places as quickly as houses get to places. And when streets aren't paved, it has huge effects on health, for example, and, and the infrastructure isn't there. So this is a, a program between the municipal governments, the large cement company, the community, and ourselves. And, and we're there with, together with the company with, a, with second and third loss guarantees. And the picture of all this is a community comes together and if a minimum of 80% of the people who live on a block or a series of blocks want to come in, then the municipality says, okay, we'll put the infrastructure. You guys are each going to take a $1,000 loan and that's going to pay for the paving and a piece of the infrastructure. We, the city, will take a, call it a 5% first loss guarantee piece. And then we, the, the, the IDB, as well as the company, will take a second loss piece. We put it all together and, you know, there have been thousands of loans that have made, been made. The loss rate is, you know, next to nothing. Um, oh, and the community has a piece of the, of the second loss guarantee. We're actually the third. So, so what did that take from a government perspective, right? It took really a lot of soft skills, let's say. It took the willingness to sit down and think about the problem from a multi-dimensional perspective, then being willing to take a piece of their own budget and put it up, both in terms of infrastructure and uh, first loss guarantee. And that is sort of their, their demonstration of the fact that this is actually going to better the quality of life of their citizens. It's going to actually strengthen their city as a whole as a destination for business. Tax revenues have been seen to go up. You know, it's got all of those kinds of benefits. But you have to be willing to kind of think about the, the, the question and the problem in a pretty broad way. Semex is a, a huge cement company with massive capillarity throughout the region and actually throughout the world. So leveraging their platform and their willingness to put the program together and be the bank in many ways is, um, is a hugely valuable asset. Um, on using sort of a, a, a different example, and not in every one of these cases, in fact, does government even have to do anything. Um, you know, we're working with Pepsi in Mexico, and they were sitting there going, okay, we have an obesity problem in Mexico that's massive, so let's try to make snacks somewhat healthier. And that meant using safflower oil instead of what they were using, and lo and behold, that value chain has, has just had been decimated as a result of NAFTA, basically, um, over the in previous 10 years. So yes, they put up true seed capital to help those growers organized in cooperatives, you know, guarantees going this way and that way, but, but that didn't require any activity from government, and it's, it's really working. Mm -hmm. and, on, and on the other hand, um, an example that I think I used in Peru about a a public utility company. So they, they are a manifestation of the government in some ways. And, and they were saying, we've got to balance some public policy priorities with a profitability model. And, and looking at the customers that we've got. So, you know, they're the power company. Everybody's their customer in Medellin. And they know everybody's credit history, basically, better than any credit bureau. So they said, well, we can use that asset to achieve a whole bunch of things. And they launched a, a loan program to provide construction supplies, uh, appliances that were more energy efficient and could help them deal with decreasing the load on the grid and addressing not having to build more uh, generation capacity relative to climate change, and technology. So half a million people have taken loans for construction supplies, and 100,000 people have taken loans for new appliances, and 50,000 people have taken loans for tablets, computers, and internet service. 
And that, the combination of that is now reported into all the credit bureaus, so there's credit history building. They've achieved the climate change goal that they wanted to achieve. They've brought internet connectivity to a segment of the population that's critical for delivering other social services that the government wants to reach that group mm -hmm. of people. So, you know, again, I just, I think it's, a, it's the ability to think creatively and more holistically that most of these models require. Very interesting, Th thank you. And, That's not mine. And, and Mildred, building off of uh, what Julie talked about, yeah. some of the important soft mm -hmm. elements of what mm -hmm. we're talking about here. I mean, I think that there's, there's a set of policies that are, as an investor, you know, tax credits, co-investments, guarantees, things that literally affect your bottom line. But a lot of what we have in the report is process and engagement and relationships and the conversation and being creative uh, in partnership. And uh, from, from your perspective as an investor, I mean, that, what's the importance of those soft policies, if you will, versus the hard, you know, change the, the, the calculation for, uh, for CIF? I mean, it's, it's absolutely critical because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. all of these policy tools that get developed, the, the guarantee programs, the tax credits, have to be implemented by people. And people have to have incentives. They have to have those incentives aligned in order to, to make something work. Um, and and um, th there would have to be you know, a lot of things removed that are disincentives. So first of all, I think you know, one of the key things is that you have to start with what it is you want to achieve. And in, in the case that uh, Julie described, it wasn't you know, how do we use a tax credit. It was we have a specific you know, problem that we want to solve, and these are the tools. And I think that is one of the mind shifts that is often difficult you know, if you're sitting in a, in a public policy role, because what you have are tools. But what you want to do is use those tools to solve the problem. And so because it's, it's, it's people ultimately they have to implement, you really have to begin to pull that apart and figure out, you know, where are the blockages? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about David's uh, wheel over there, and I'm looking at it as a, like a water wheel on a, you know, a, an old-fashioned mill. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, it's great once the water gets to the wheel, and it will turn and create a lot of power, and a lot of good things will happen. But when you start upstream, you know, how many boulders are there that are diverting that water flow? And am I removing the right boulder? Because I can remove the one right above the mill. And it's still not going to be very good if there are 15 other boulders you know, higher upstream. And so I think you know, when we think in terms of policy tools, sometimes you know, that's part of where we get stuck. We say, I have this perfectly good you know, credit guarantee. I don't understand why these banks in Sub-Saharan Africa or elsewhere are not using them. And, it, and it's because you're thinking in terms of tools and not you know, achieving the ultimate uh, objective. And then coming back to that, you know, what is it that's going to empower people to think creatively how, how to use those tools. And it increasingly comes back to, you know, what's my personal incentive? Um, and if, you know, if I can you know, earn the same salary, get the same bonus, uh, get the same kudos from my boss from doing things the way I've always done them without those guarantees, why should I learn a new product, take some risk, have to tangle with my risk manager who doesn't agree with me about you know, whether I've increased the risk or decreased the cost or whatever, um, you know, life is much simpler if I just do it the way I've done it. So until you deal with some of those incentives, and you know, governments around the world have them, bureaucracies around the world have them, corporations have them, we all, we all you know, are comfortable doing things the way we've done them. And this is about a mindset change, as the report you know, establishes. And so it, it really is about um, you know, what are, what's standing between you know, me and where I need to get to, you know, there many things are going to interact. By the time I get down to that last boulder before the, the power wheel, you know, there may have been an earthquake and the whole thing may have shifted. So I've got to react and adapt. But I think it, it is about, um, you know, keeping our eye on the problem and then letting the tools fall into place and be adapted over time. Great. Thanks, Mildred. The, the wonderful analogy. Um, and, and continuing with it, um, Carl, I mean, you're really doing this work on the ground. and and. You know, we hear from uh, entrepreneurs sometimes that governments drop as many boulders into that river as they do remove them. <laughs> exactly. Right? I mean, Some man-made, man right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there's a sense that, that government can be as much of a barrier as, as it is an opportunity. And I'm just wondering if you can reflect on that in terms of your day-to-day -day work. If you could tell us a little bit about your business also and, sure, and then I, I where can. government sort of plays the, both plays a positive role. role. You know, I think the first book is a, a nonprofit. It's an NGO. We're based here in Washington, D.C. 
And uh, what, we, what we are, the best way, the easiest way to describe it is we are a supply pipeline that provides the highest quality books and educational resources uh, to preschools, after schools, Title I classrooms, basically anywhere where kids are gathered for an uh, informal or formal educational setting. And, uh, and what we're really trying to do, though, is invert the publishing industry. You know, what we recognize is that the fundamental design of the publishing industry in the U.S. and in many countries is uh, it's based on consignment, and, uh, and that messes everything up. And so uh, First Book has stepped in to aggregate the market in the lowest third of the country. Uh, we are in Canada as well, and we've, you know, we're in our 21st year, we've given away about uh, 100 million books, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're growing by about 35% annually these days. We work with basically all the major publishers, and we're just about to <coughs> spread our wings into, uh, onto the global scene. So that gives you somewhat uh, Okay. It's always dangerous to ask a social entrepreneur to describe their business. I'll have you guys canceling your dinner plans so I can drag you through. The, but, uh, you know, and I guess the first book really, uh, honestly, you know, I have, uh, I spent uh, uh, the early part of my career as a lawyer here in Washington. And uh, so I had uh, a lot of exposure to government uh, and, you know, from that uh, perspective. and. And uh, as, uh, you know, I, I've got to say that we designed First Book uh, outside of that system and, and, and really strategically outside of that decision, to be honest about it, because we felt that we could design a, uh, an enterprise that uh, stole the best strategies from the private sector and applied them to uh, new models for a very old industry. And I, but, but really to take my experience uh, over these past years, and I, I, I was really struck by this report and because I've, I've sort of both been a, a player in the field of social enterprise, but also kind of a student of it. And uh, I happily, you know, I serve on the board of Ashoka, and I, so I've done a lot of work in the international realm. Uh, with a lot of different kinds of organizations, and I, uh, you know, this was this was a great read, and I really want to, you know, as a book person, I'll, I'll use a I'll use a uh, book analogy. I laughed, I cried, I, you know, I, uh, but it was uh, it it was sort of simultaneously very heartening because it was uh, the fact that major thought leading organizations at the global level are grabbing the reins and that there are frankly reins to grab after 20 years because you know 20 years ago people just thought charity was something lovely that you did you know on the weekends and it was uh, and and so it's a dramatic difference that there that there's work you know in going on in so many countries and that the effort is profound to see these enormous institutions with their roots deep in uh, traditions uh, trying to dance with each other, right? The, the frustrating part uh, as a practitioner is that, uh, is that I, I frankly don't think we're ever gonna get definitions. And I think it's, one, I think it's a really elusive chase uh, because I think that once we get our hands on it, it'll change. And honestly, that's probably means we're doing it right uh, because we need, you know, I, I look at my own work and I think uh, in order to really transform publishing and what's available in classrooms to teachers and, you know, we, we need, if we can't possibly imagine that we can do that without partnering with major educational institutions. It will not happen in the U.S. without the unions. In, in other countries without other significant governmental engagement. At the, and, and those kind, you know, those kinds of large institutions, the examples you gave are stunning, you know, and so hopeful, yep. you know. Yep. And uh, uh, those sorts of institutions are gonna need a very different set of uh, incentives and in, in innovations to motivate them, large corporations that uh, are going to need a very different set of structures to motivate them because 
they, they're not necessarily inherently entrepreneurial, right? They, they may be social activists uh, because it's good for business, but these are not institutions that are fundamentally motivated by Absolutely. social cause, right? And, uh, and I don't quarrel, quarrel with that. I think they, they are who they are. And on the other hand, these large institutions are likely to gain traction because uh, of a combination of uh, great designs from government as well as uh, those of us out here who are kind of in the gadfly category, you know, uh, who are moving enough business, making enough traction that we uh, help to sort of swoop around and as social entrepreneurs running small or mid-size enterprises that we can play that, uh, that gadfly role for mm -hmm. major industries. And I think uh, the, the range of complexities of who we're talking about, the institutions we need, and we need them all. And so, the, you know, to, to watch this report unfold, uh, really creative, bright people who are trying to motivate government, which is, you know, worldwide, not the fountain of innovation, right? I mean, it's not designed to be. And deeply rooted corporations that are not designed to be motivated by social cause, and then simultaneously motivating, you know, groups like mine that are by definition in business for social change. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary Rubik's Cube, you know? Uh -huh. So it's, I, I'm frustrated on the one hand and I'm proud on the other, you know? And, and uh, so great, great work, Catherine and team, <laughs> because this is, it's this kind of like taking 10 steps back and thinking about it that will force, you know, that'll force uh, action as we go. Great, right. thank you, Kyle. And I think, um, you know, Jonathan's comments were very, uh, Inspiration, inspirational too, like building off what you said. It was, it's wonderful to hear about the work happening in the White House. Um, and following on from that, I mean, we've talked a lot about a shift in mindset. And, and Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, you've been a leader uh, in, in this for a number of years now at OPIC. I mean, OPIC is really an international, um, uh, you know, poster child in impact investing and the work you've been doing is incredibly innovative. I mean, what did that require within OPIC? I mean, what's the ch mindset change within that agency? And in terms of your dealings with other public officials, I mean, how have, I mean, has that been hard work internally for you? Or did it, you know, what's been the process in OPIC? Well, I should, I should first call out Mitchell Strauss, who many mm. of you know, who's been leading a lot of this work within, within OPIC. But I, I think, you, I, I have to come back, and I apologize to the sort of definitional thing again, because that was one of the biggest issues we had, is, you know, the guys that are doing renewable energy projects in South Sudan or building, you know, three-star hotels in Afghanistan saying, wait a minute, you mean my work isn't impact investing? It's hugely impactful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, arguably, it's the big corporations that don't go out, that go about their work with the intent to do social good that are doing more social good than the smaller ones that seek to do so. So th that was one of the issues we had was saying, you know, it's okay to have a social, good that, that is done as a byproduct mm -hmm. of your financial first uh, ambitions, not, as a, not as, a, as a singular goal. So that was, I think, one of the first things is saying, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, if you have a social impact but you didn't seek to do so, that's okay too. Right. Um, and I think this, one of the second I issues we've had is the perception of risk, mm -hmm. which is if it's an impact investment, does that mean you're giving the money away? Or if it's an impact investment, does that mean I'm going to get as much money as I would if it wasn't? And that, those are things that a big organization needs to be clear on when you decide how much of your portfolio you're going to focus uh, on these things. What we've found is that when we went back, and again, Mitchell led this great work, in order to demonstrate that you could do social innovation and impact investments in a way that was still profitable and not too risky and successful, because we really wanted to offer up to the field uh, you know, longitudinal data that showed you could make both financial mm -hmm. and social returns, that to, to sort of quell the naysaying, mm -hmm. um, we found that we were actually doing a lot of impact investing. In fact, last year, when you went back and looked at our portfolio and identified which deals really did have the intent to do social good and, and at the core of their business model, but to do so in a, in, a, in a financially sustainable way, it was $330 million out of the $3.2 billion we did last year. So mm -hmm. 
that's a pretty hefty chunk mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. transactions. From what we mm -hmm. know, we don't know this for sure yet, those transactions that we did that were social first, but still financially sustainable, didn't have a riskier profile, didn't perform worse in a material way than those that weren't. So that, those are the kind of things that I think we really need to be able to show that mm -hmm. to calm people down that we're not gotten all soft in the head. Right, you know? <laughs> That's great. I mean, is that data av available publicly? Uh -huh. yeah. You yeah. see, Mitchell? Uh Everyone <laughs> wants it. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a fantastic data yeah. point that we could use. Would um, be very useful. Yeah, yeah and, and Julie, similarly, I mean, it, it, what have you seen in terms of the changing mindset? You described it a little bit. We were talking earlier and you mentioned mm -hmm. the example in Massachusetts. So, I mean, I'd be interested in your views on what U.S. policymakers can learn from what you're seeing outside of the U.S. Um, so, so we were talking earlier and it sort of goes to what does it sometimes take and it does take a change of view. And I was talking about something we've done on the health side in Central America. And, and to make a long story relatively short, uh, the Gates Foundation and Carlos Slim Foundation put up money together with us to get results quickly in health. So anything you did had to show results in 18 months, which meant that if your usual procurement process took two years, you couldn't, you couldn't apply, right? So, so in El Salvador, they had to make two very big changes. They had to put uh, micronutrients on the list of, of uh, medical products that were allowed to be imported into the countries, a two and a half year process typically, took three months. And the procurement took two months instead of two years, <laughs> right? So why? Because the incentive was so big. Yeah. For every dollar in the health budget that they put up for this project, the foundation put up a dollar. And at the end of the 18 months, if there are results, they get another bonus payment of 50% of the cost to use in their health budget however they want. So there was a lot of incentive there, right? And, and it took that to get this to happen. And by the way, I should say, we got quicker internally at the IDB <laughs> at some of the things we had to do. Um, but, but when you look at some of the things that we think are good ideas, so social, social impact bonds, they require here changes. So what government, what state or local government has the ability to, to agree to do a contingent payment seven years from now and fund it then? Not so many. So, you know, in Massachusetts, they've put through a piece of legislation that allows them to fund the contingent payments in the future through a sinking fund so that when you get to seven years from now and you actually owe the money, if it worked, the money is actually there, not, oops, not in the budget this year, right? So, so clearly they too have said there's enough in it for us that we're going to go and we're going to create legislative change. And I do think that that that's part of what's going on here. You have to be able to articulate what it's worth to the various constituencies to get them to do or invest what's necessary to do. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I do have a final question. I'm going to come yeah. round yeah. um, at the end and ask you all, sort of looking forward looking. But um, at this point, I'm happy to turn it over uh, to our audience. Thank you all for being here. And um, we can take a few questions. Um, so please, if you've got one, raise your hand and there's a mic at the back of the room. There's, there's, there's one up here, Tracy. And please uh, introduce yourself as well. My name, uh, my name is Dave Haft, uh, founder of Impact Hub, or social enterprise. My question's for Julie. Um, in Latin America, you mentioned uh, tablets, loans going out for tablets and technology. Uh -huh. So that's an area that I'm particularly interested in. And I'm wondering if you have any other anecdotal stories or just uh, uh, case studies you'd like to share with us where technology and social entrepreneurship um, and maybe impact investing are, are converging? Well, okay, so it will be more in the area of uh, anecdotal <laughs> than anything else. We've, we've launched, we're in the midst of launching a large broadband initiative because uh, Latin America has the highest uh, penetration of cell phones of any region, more than one per one. <laughs> um, but it's got really bad connectivity. And, and you can see the effects of this across you know, large, many, many, many topics that you could think of. Um, but I think there are some interesting, I'll use an example in Uruguay, where we were involved in the first One Laptop Per Child um, initiative. And, and, and there's a lot to be said for One Laptop Per Child. Uh, 
designed the right way, which is not about the laptop, but about the cheater training and about things that you put on the laptop. It's a big value chain, or it's, or it's not such a great investment. Mm -hmm. But part of that value chain has been on the order of social entrepreneurship, where the, the either the apps in the one case or the, the software and programs in the other that have made the one laptop per child a much more valuable tool in Uruguay have come out of the world of social entrepreneurs. Um, and so that's been really important. And there's been some interesting seed capital bit available for them. It was the sort of ecosystem was thought through to encourage that kind of thing. Um, there are some health initiatives elsewhere in the region where the availability of either smartphones or tablets um, are a key enabler of what the social entrepreneur wants to achieve. So uh, whether it's eyeglasses and eyeglass tests and things in one place, or there are a couple things going on in Mexico. So I, I think that um, connectivity and affordable devices are going to be a key driver that open up sort of the next, the next level of social entrepreneurship ideas in the region. Brenda, Elizabeth. Yeah, I would just w highlight a couple of others that I think we're, we're probably all familiar with too, and that is, for example, the pay the, the pay as you go solar equipment, for example, sure. in Africa, where you've got a card mm -hmm. that you're enabling you, you, that enables you to pay for as much electricity as you can afford. I think that's very interesting. And another one which I, I found I find very powerful was how many you know, welfare programs throughout the world used to be paid in cash, and when you can mm -hmm. pay those yeah. welfare programs on a prepaid card you not only reduce, dramatically reduce leakage, but you enable the, the recipient to save to money and use it when they want to, and you bring them into the banking system. So that's a super simple means of actually bringing a huge amount of people into the financial system you know, very simply. Uh, so I think that's another, at the very basic end of the spectrum, that's another application of technology in a way that's financially viable and, and really transformative. Great. Do we have another question at the back? <coughs> Thanks. Good afternoon, Wilmot Allen from the Partnership for Urban Innovation. I actually was just in South Africa and had a conversation with the media executive there. And we were pondering the fact that um, outside the U.S. and most of the West, in the developing world, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of innovation when it comes to entertainment and media. And we all know the profound yeah. impact that that has. And so I'm just curious as to um, what ideas the panelists may have in terms of where that's being done, particularly funding projects, whether it's MTV Africa or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, the power of media. Um, anyone? Kyle? Maybe? Yeah, okay. okay, I'll take a swing. Um, you know, I think the, the, the funding of, of media tends to be, in the innovation side, very local. Um, and so that may be why you, know, you don't see it big pictures, bright lights. But I'll, I'll give you an example of something we've done. There's a, there's a huge music industry in Brazil. And, and you wouldn't be surprised to hear that. But what you would be surprised to hear is that the major labels represent, I don't know, something like 5 to 10% of the music industry in Brazil. What really drives the music industry in Brazil is actually in-person performance and most people who are involved in the music industry give away their music free online in order to drive a huge income stream around actual performances. Mm -hmm. And there's a very large population of people in Rio who derive their incomes from all the things that go with it, whether it's lighting or acoustics or uh, labeling or all this kind of stuff. So it goes back to the technology thing and basic skill that people need around how to be an entrepreneur and how to run a business. So we've done work with that group of people, and it's, you know, it's like 100,000 people plus in Rio, to work on that and, and to be involved in sort of helping redefine and, in, and enlarge the concept of music in the context of Rio. Um, and, then, and then I would say throughout the region, we've done a lot of things that are entertainment that have to do with local culture um, and local heritage. And they're generally small scale because you know, what is 
what is entertainment in Barranquilla is different than what it is in Medellin, which is different than what it is in Bogota. So it, I think this is an area where it's, um, it's kind of work intensive and it's very, very local. I, and there are examples on the other side. I mean, Mexican music, for example. But, but by and large, it's pretty local, I think. I think Julie has the best job <laughs> <laughs> of any of us. <laughs> Yes, please, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Shripti from Deloitte's GovLab. Um, my question is, um, have you seen, have any of you seen examples of either impact investors or social enterprises or government using evidence and analysis in deciding what to scale and what not? And, and how do you think, what do you think the capacity is like for either of those three players in terms of being comfortable with using evidence and analysis and making decisions? That's a great question. Yeah, and, it's, and it sounds like we would, some of what you've talked about, there's definitely a necessity for very serious you know, evaluation of outcomes. And yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I think just iteration, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things that, that um, you know, sometimes gets lost because we talk about innovation and we think, you know, what's new, new, new. But what we really need to think about is the evolution of innovation because ultimately, you know, the, the program that has the tight deadline to get it done, they're going to learn some things. Not sure, everything is sure. going to work. And, right. it, and, and if you can stick with it and keep the attention, you know, at the policy level, you know, spotlighted long enough to, you know, take some of that evidence-based, you know, analysis into account in the next iteration, I think that's very important. But, but for me, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal for this new space because, just as Elizabeth said, there have been many actors in this space, in, including ourselves, but haven't been around for 20-some years now, that have been doing things that weren't called impact investing, that weren't called social innovation or social entrepreneurship at the time. And you know, now they can fit under this rubric, and you can argue about you know, how much is in the tent and out of the tent. But at, at the end of the day, there's a lot of lessons that have been learned. And there is you know, data out there about, you know, depending on what your objective is, financial versus you know, measuring other kinds of impact, that, that can be taken into account. And I guess my, my plea for this space is that in the name of innovation, let's not lose sight of the fact that there have been other innovations in the past that have evolved and iterated and now you know, need uh, some additional investment to, to scale up and to, to move in sometimes you know, different directions just as technology changes, um, for, for example. So I think, um, y yes, you know, one of the good things about uh, the new focus on impact investment is that metrics have been a big part of that. And so a lot of data is being gathered. Um, you know, much is still in the infant stages, but you know, don't forget there have been organizations like PCV and SEEF and uh, Acumen and others that, and you know, the, not to name the DFIs that have you know rich history and experience about what works and what's had to evolve over time because it didn't always work. Right, Kyle. Yeah. If, if you, I, this is a really important thing because I think it's going to make the difference between whether we make good fast <laughs> progress or we don't and. And in my mind, it goes, uh, there are two big issues. One is uh, we've got to get really, we've got to engender a climate where people are really honest about uh, what's going on. And because honestly, if you talk to foundations, very, very traditional foundations, I suspect nine out of 10 of them will tell you that they've been looking at you know, it, you know, that every time they give a grant, they ask, you know, what happened and, you know, what the results were. And I, I, will, I will say that 95% of those uh, reportings uh, are, are probably uh, hopeful and aspirational more than real, <laughs> all right? And, uh, uh, and I, I think that the, the reason why it looks like that in the field is because everybody's afraid. And they are afraid that if they are honest about failure in social enterprise, that they will, they will not only lose that funder, but the, the rep will get out there. And, uh, and, and so we have a climate that favors people who, uh, who fake it and does not uh, favor real innovation, hard analysis, are we getting it done? And then rewards people when they go back and retool and get back in the game, mm, just yeah. to your point. Yeah. And, and I think what it also urges, you know, if we, when we don't have that kind of transparent, 
hard looking at, at data and, and at uh, evaluating what's really going on in models, it turns into insider uh, pull, you know, because then, it, you know, nobody wants to say the bad news and we all just kind of talk to each other, right? And that, that the, the private sector, the purely private sector side has, uh, is better at that you know, uh, than, than the social sector side because we are still coming out of the era when we uh, all want to just hold hands and sing kumbaya, you know, one more time. And, and I think we've got to, on the outside, not as funders, you know, because you guys have the yardsticks, but in the field, we have to get pretty steely about how we, what our objectives are, what, who's doing the best work, and there has to be a little bit of that friction of, of competition so that we push each other in the right direction, I think. That's great. Thanks, Carl. And Julie, you had a comment too. Right, so, so this is a theme near and dear to my heart because I'm a big believer in you know, all of our institutions, whether we're funders or whether we're doers, have a, an aversion to talking about failure and things that didn't work the way we wanted them to. Mm -hmm. and, and we're trying really hard to, to change that view. Um, so I'll tell a story of that, which is we, we um, funded something together with AusAid um, and uh, a large bank in Peru focused on training 100,000 female micro entrepreneurs and 10,000 uh, female owners of small businesses to look at why these businesses didn't really grow and figure out whether certain parts of the training could help their businesses grow much more quickly. Um, and the idea was that really people hadn't done that, this kind of training with women in a way that they had good control groups which led you to actually know whether or not it worked. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, an awful lot of people were spending an awful lot of money on training, right? So right. either spend the money because it achieved something or stop spending the money and just accept okay. you know, that, that reality You're and try to figure out some other answer. Um, so we were pretty new. So we're, we're, you know, in answer to the question, we're really now quite driven on, on these kinds of metrics. And we're doing a lot of very good experimental, quasi-experimental impact evaluation to really, really know when it's an important question, did it really work, right? Um, but you know, you have to start. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that the first time you do a impact evaluation, you may not be that good at it. <laughs> because I, you know, I've now looked, I read the impact evaluation, I've looked at the results and I've gone, shit, we really didn't ask quite the right questions. <laughs> right, and so, so we've got answers, but we don't have really definitive answers. And the thing that turned out to be the single most important thing, we didn't ask any of the right questions, which is that it's the most expensive element, which is mentoring, which clearly has the biggest impact but we didn't measure it in a way that really lets us know, okay, it may be the most expensive, but was the return sufficient that it's okay to spend that money, right? Mm -hmm. So now, the good news is that everybody who's involved in this says, you know what, so we learned a lot. We didn't learn quite what we really needed to learn, so let's throw some more money in, and let's, now that we've learned this, let's iterate. Let's do X and Y, and look at the data in a different way, and do some more work, and figure out mm -hmm. how to get this right. That's great. So, you know, I think that that's part of what we have to do. That's great. Well, um, we just have a few more minutes, and I'm going to take the, uh, the, the moderator's privilege of asking the last question. But it, it seems like this is a particularly auspicious time, um, particularly with the G8 meeting coming up. When, when I spoke to the Cabinet Office about what's driving all this interest in the UK and what's motivating policymakers, you know, they said significant growth in the market, 38% a year in social impact investing in the UK. Clearly, uh, the focus of the mind. Um, the demonstration effect of social innovation as a sort of pilot for the future mm -hmm. of what public service delivery can look like. And finally, reform of the public service to be more um, focused on early intervention and prevention rather than cure. And they were really the three underlying motivators driving a lot of that interest in the UK. And, and it, it seems like those kinds of things, those mega trends are present probably in different forms throughout, throughout the world. And, and so we have that piece in place. We now have a track record, data we're talking about, lessons of what has worked, has, has not, a sort of platform, including this report. Um, so what's next? Where do, we, where do we go from here? We'll just go down the line, Elizabeth, if you want to begin a final reflection. Um, okay, I, yeah, I have a, I've, uh, just a few thoughts on that because I, I'm, an, I'm so excited about what could be done if we get it right and nervous about what could happen if we mess it up. 
despite the fact that we all need to embrace failure. Um, I, it's I, hard to I, do. I'm Two sorry different about that. kinds of failure, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to maybe just thinking back about Mildred's and that water wheel analogy, which I really like so much. Um, and I just think about over the course of my career, some of the things that I've seen governments doing to throw boulder, boulders in the way of the stream. Um, so maybe I just say, mention a few of those, like starting with the engagement of actors. You know, oftentimes I find governments don't engage the people that they're trying to incentivize with their behavior. And that is a problem. You think of the SME lending facilities throughout history where a lot of money was given to a bank to on-lend to SMEs and not a penny ever moved because they forgot to talk to the banks about why on earth would they bother doing this <laughs> if they could just buy treasury bills. Exactly. It's a much easier way to make money. So engaging with the actors, which I think is number one on your wheel, mm -hmm. I think is a very powerful way that we can governments can mess it up. Secondly, I, I find that um, there's often a tendency to create new things mm -hmm. and rather than actually remove things that may be in the way or fix things that are broken. So one has to think only about the fact that in this country you can give away your money and not tell anybody about anything, whereas if you want to put your money into an impact investment, you have to report to the SEC. So that's a fix. Mm -hmm. You don't have to build anything new to take that boulder out of the water path. Um, then the third thing I was thinking is, Sometimes actually a bad, a, a sort of okay policy that's stable is better than a, a volatile, a good one that's volatile. Mm -hmm. One has to think there only in the case of when countries throughout the world want to attract renewable energy pr producers into their markets, they establish feed-in tariffs, commitments to buy that energy at a certain price. Great. Huge boost to having energy, renewable energy producers flow into that market, but then they change the policy, which then puts a damper on renewable energy globally because one or two countries flip the policy around. So I think the, we can't under, uh, overestimate or overstate the importance <coughs> of uh, policy stability. And then lastly, I would say, I think uh, sometimes governments don't, sec, penultimate, governments don't think about unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Well-intentioned, great policies, but really can mess things up. Uh, those of you that lived through the microfinance um, crisis in India know that the or origin of that problem in many respects was a priority sector lending by well-intentioned Indian government saying 40% of your money banks has to go to these sectors that are high priorities, one of them being microfinance. Well, the banks just loaded up on this stuff and microfinance institutions were forced to grow at a rate they couldn't handle. Big consequences of a well-intentioned well po policy. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the kind of things that we need to really think through and, and take lessons from failures and lessons from history. Um, and I think the last and the, most one, the one I feel most passionate about again coming from microfinance is please we got to cool the hype because I'm hearing people saying well impact investment has been disappointing because it's the growth has been slow and uneven and I feel like saying are you kidding we're changing the way the world thinks about money and right. about changing the world and this is not slow this is fast this is amazing <laughs> but if we keep over promising and over hepping it I'm talking about 30% growth, mm -hmm. then I think we're all going to be disappointed, and that will be a very damaging thing for all of the really good things that are that are happening. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think really just to follow on that, I mean, it's all about staying power in my in my view because um, we are going to continue to iterate and evolve, and there are going to be things happening at all points on this spectrum, and that's a good thing. So everything doesn't have to be fresh new startup cutting edge. Um, you know, a lot of garden variety things, you know, we can, we can think about them as sort of delivery mechanisms. You know, they already work. How can we amplify the good that they're doing by maybe putting in some of that philanthropic capital alongside? So you've got a, a successful business and maybe it would like to do more to help its employees. You know, let's not always uh, think about starting a new business in order to do that. And I think that's the same way in terms of the organizations in this social sector. There are a lot of organizations that are evolving and iterating their model right now because they see that, that this potential window of funding might open, um, and they're preparing themselves. So let's stick with it long enough to, to see uh, you know, whether these results, whether these flowers bloom, right? And, right. and, and let's not always think that the next bright, new, shiny toy is the place to put our money. All along that spectrum, there are very important places right. to invest. Thanks, Mildred. Julie? Okay, so what's next? So first I would say um, there's one thing beyond those three things that the Cabinet Office mentioned, which is tight budgets. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't think tight budgets are going away, and I think that they're a big 
underlying motivation for trying to find alternative ways to fund important things. And I don't see that changing if the municipal level in particular and the state level, and in many countries at the federal level for a long time, and it's going to continue to be a driver behind all of this. Um, here's what I hope will change. I hope that impact investors will get more discriminating about, and Elizabeth alluded to this, the level of financial return required relative to the level of social return they're looking for. Because right now, I think that that is a calculus that mm -hmm. doesn't actually exist right. and doesn't get articulated and it's just flat out wrong. Because you don't get social return without investing and so it's gotta be paid for somewhere and we need to somehow change that dialogue amongst investors. And I think the other, the other one thing I'll mention is, I hope that we're going to move to a place where social entrepreneurs themselves are less competitive with each other. We have set up an ecosystem where things are called, with Ashoka or others, competitions. Who's the best and they get the money. Who's the, right? We've created so this so that each one is out there looking for everybody here to get funding. So they are inherently in competition with each other. But if you actually look at the social entrepreneurs with businesses like yours and others, there's a huge amount of collaborative potential that's being wasted. Mm -hmm. And if we find a way to think about changing that from a competition mm -hmm. to more collaboration, mm -hmm. I think we will you know, multiply by many times the impact that our social entrepreneurs and, and investors can have. Great, thank you, Julie. Kyle? And actually, that feeds in nicely. Well, my point. Point. <laughs> so thank you very much. The, uh, uh, I guess I think I would, uh, I hope that we, that we open this, the systems up because uh, having, we've done several rounds of raising capital uh, and it is, uh, it is very difficult even with, uh, m you know, many years of financial success uh, to, uh, knock on the, you know, it's, it puts you into sort of a retail mode of knocking on one door after another after another. And, and it is both inefficient and, uh, and it also uh, ends up with funders uh, uh, really talking to a very narrow universe of options for uh, programs and enterprises to fund. And it, and it also dampens what, uh, you know, the ability to really blow the doors off of great social enterprises. So it doesn't serve, the current system doesn't serve anybody. So I don't know what Wikipedia-like model uh, would, you know, allow us to talk to each other in a grander, more open marketplace than currently exists, but we desperately need to get there. And I, f I believe that if we had a really open marketplace, <coughs> uh, that it would detoxify yeah. Yeah. the fistfights, yeah. uh, you know, the competitive uh, who's best fistfights because there would be uh, many, many more opportunities on both sides, on both sides. It feeds back to what Elizabeth said at the beginning, which is right. you can give your money to anybody, but right. if you want to invest your money, we need a big picture Fix. Right, and, right. and, you know, one final thing I'd also say is I want to make sure that as we step out that we include uh, uh, traditional banks in, in the scene because uh, honestly, when, when First Book has been looking, we have ended up doing our financing with traditional banks. The interest rates were lower sure. uh, uh, and, and the, the, the uh, process was faster. And so, you know, I, I want to not forget the elephants out there who, uh, who have been, you know, plodding along in the field forever and make sure that we incentivize them to be comfortable uh, holding hands with the social sector, which they are not uniformly now. Great, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks again to the Aspen <coughs> Institute for having us, and, uh, and please join me in thanking the panel. Always something new to think about. Always something new to think about. Thank you. That was great.